Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Shauna Morn is training us to be effective remote workers. Shauna, is it okay if I ask you a couple of questions so that the audience can get to know you a little better? Yes, Roger. Okay, first question. What led you to work in the space of remote working and leadership? My journey started over seven years ago when I was based in Ireland. You might notice the Irish accent. And I was working for a Canadian company called Shopify, which some of you might be familiar with. And I was managing a remote team across eight different time zones. And this was before remote working was the done thing or there wasn't much knowledge out there. And I really struggled with a lot of the challenges that you guys have mentioned today and more from a leadership perspective, from a time management, from a company culture. Although I really enjoyed remote working, there was also a lot of limitations with it. And that led me back to university where I studied innovation management. I based all of my research around remote teams and researched what it took to make a remote company successful. And that's my background. My, my background started from the problems that a lot of my clients and a lot of business owners and teams face today in 2020. Oh, wonderful. Your timing was perfect, wasn't it? Who knew? People said, are you looking into a crystal ball? I yeah. said, no, I, I didn't know this was going to happen. Never yeah. did I think this was going Wonderful. to happen. Uh, speaking of your clients, can you share some of the results that your clients have had as a result of uh, working with you uh, from a leadership perspective? Yeah, from a leadership perspective and, and why I always say that, you know, when we're looking at remote teams, when we're looking at remote companies, we have to start with us as leaders. Um, you know, I read a quote today by Jim Rohn, which I think for, for entrepreneurs, it, it rings so true. And it says, your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development because success is something you attract by the person you become. So from developing leaders internally with organizations, we generate results. So one of the leaders I recently worked with, who was a founder of a fast growing agency, by being able to put uh, effective management teams in place and effectively delegating and tightening up communication processes remotely, this leader saves 64 hours per month of his time. So he was able to focus on the things that he enjoyed and the strategic selling of the business and growing the business. Um, we do a lot of other things around employee engagement and satisfaction. So, you know, depending on how companies measure that varies, but one of my recent clients, we improved employee engagement on a remote team by 54%. And that is starting again with the leader, showing them how to be more effective in having conversations with their team, how to build those interpersonal relationships, which we, you guys touched upon earlier. Um, and that holistic approach to remote working. Wonderful, 54%. I'm looking forward to your talk very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, audience members, if you have questions, would you please uh, type them into the chat? And then uh, periodically during Shauna's talk, I will pose your questions to her. And there's also a Q&A period at the end of Shauna's talk. Uh, the video will be... Uh, the video recording of Shauna's training session will be uh, made available uh, no later than noon tomorrow and possibly even uh, this evening. So stand by for news on that. Uh, so now, Shauna, are you ready to rock the stage? Yes, let's do it. Then show <laughs> us how it's done. Take it away, Shauna Morn. Thanks, Roger. So it's lovely to be here with you guys tonight and uh, to, to see so many new faces. Um, I'm really excited about the talk tonight. And, and, you know, it sounds like a lot of you guys really enjoy working from home and it's, you know, going really well for you. So tonight, I hope that you're going to take away some new strategies, new habits that can serve you as a self-employed entrepreneur that's working from home, or if you are a leader. So if you're managing teams, uh, that are remote, that if you're thinking about building teams that are remote, even if you're working with contractors or you're even managing relationships with clients, there are a lot of strategies that we're going to cover tonight that will serve you for all cases. 
So let me dive into it. So a lot of us do struggle working from home, um, especially in 2020, because it's not a normal remote working environment. Even those of us that have worked remotely before 2020 and 2019 or before are still experiencing challenges that are new. We've all had to adapt in many different ways. So with a lot of the clients I work with, I'm finding that the biggest challenge is how are they sustaining themselves? How are they sustaining themselves and their organizations in being able to, to balance both life and work? So that structure has been stripped away from us, that physical structure of an office, or whether it was that structure that we, that we had last year that you know, helped us sustain ourselves and managing ourselves, going to the gym, going to a co-working space, meeting with clients, going to the coffee shop, whatever it is, those practices have been stripped away. So we've had to find new ways on how to sustain ourselves. I see a lot of teams that are experiencing challenges with communication and team engagement. They ask questions like, how am I gonna motivate my team when they're working from home? People are dealing with an array of complex challenges now due to a pandemic. And, and there's so much going on behind the human behind the screen. So how do we build that level of motivation and continue that momentum when we're working as part of a team? How do we continue that within ourselves when we're self-employed, sitting at home all day, every day by ourselves? And, you know, again, when we think of that self-development, it looks different when, when we're working from home. We have to set boundaries. We have to be more self-aware and tune into what we need, whether it is more healthy food or to actually have a conversation with someone and focus that time on relationship building. So a little bit more about me. I'm based here in Vancouver in Kitsilano. I work from home. As I said, I've been doing it for the last six to seven years. I've researched remote teams extensively and I'm also an executive coach. So what I learned quite quickly on and working in the remote space is that the strategies, the processes and the technology, they do matter but they don't work unless we have the right mindset and mentality and unless we are developed as leaders for our team. And that's where the executive coaching comes in. So primarily I work with technology companies, agencies, SaaS companies, and I work with a range of businesses from startups to multinational companies. It doesn't matter to me. It's all the same. We all come with the same problems and they're all uh, humans at the end of the day. So today's agenda, what can you expect? I'm going to talk about the most common challenge I see, which is how are you sustaining yourself remote working? I know Ireland, where I'm from, has gone back into lockdown level five, which means everything is closed. So they have to deal with this again. They have to find ways to continue to motivate their team through this next level when previously they had dangled the carrot of being able to be back together in person at the end of the year. So how are we sustaining ourselves? It's getting darker, it's winter months, our habits will have changed. What are we doing to show up for ourselves and serve, serve ourselves first? Because that's really important, regardless if you're you know, a, a solo entrepreneur or you're working as part of a team, that comes first. We're gonna be looking at some communication strategies optimized for remote environments. So we'll be looking at asynchronous communication and synchronous. So that means communicating in delayed time and communicating in real time like we're doing now. So how can you leverage that to be more effective remotely? We'll also be looking at remote and hybrid team engagement and relationship building. So interpersonal relationships, whether that's with your clients that are remote, whether that's with your network, or whether that's with your team, how do we show up and build those relationships when we don't see each other? We're naturally used to that. So what do we do? We'll be going through those strategies and then we'll be looking at leadership effectiveness in remote environments. We, Roger and I kind of spoke about this a little bit earlier. We were having a chat while you guys were on a break, but we, we spoke about some of the business benefits. So if you're a business owner that has just transitioned to remote or whether you've already worked remotely and continue to do so, there are so many benefits and maybe you guys have experienced this, maybe you've based some of your experiences on this and your decisions around remote working, but the cost savings alone can be huge. I've had clients that were primarily based in an office 100% of the time, went remote due to COVID-19 
and have thrived in that environment. And they've actually had access to talent and resource that they never had access to before. They've taken on clients in brand new markets that they never had access to before. So they've made a decision to go remote first and go all in on remote because it's really, really effective. Productivity is higher which we might all know because some of us struggle to switch off from work, right? That's very common. Even before COVID, productivity is always higher, always been higher in remote teams compared to our office counterpoint workers. And that's because we don't have those water cooler moments. We don't have the commute. We don't have those distractions that naturally come up in an office. We have dedicated, quiet space oftentimes, and our productivity is much higher. Also, we don't have those boundaries, those physical boundaries in place. When you think about it, when you worked in an office or if you have experience working in an office before, when we left the office, we essentially left the, the mental notes and the thoughts about work there. Now it's very hard to, to switch that off. So productivity is higher and it's a huge benefit. But the, 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 the other side of that or the scary part, the risk is the burnout. So we need to balance the productivity with sustainability. The third point is employee retention. So if you have a team that are working remotely and what I recommend to every client is to send out a survey to get a pulse in terms of what your workforce want. Most employees and most of the clients that have done this that I work with and the research itself says that most people will prefer to continue to work from home after COVID restrictions lift. So get a pulse on that with your team is really really important as to how they see it some people want more of a hybrid approach some people want to mix they want to, to go into a co-working space and meet people there once a week and then they want to work from home but flexibility is the new normal now and as an employer or a future employer that's going to have a team you need to make sure that you're you're thinking about that future strategy and finally the international expansion opportunities so maybe you haven't considered international expansion or maybe you've really capitalized on it. For me, myself, I have clients in, I don't know how many countries, I need to do the, the maths, but countries all over in the US, in Sydney, in Ireland, in the UK, in Germany, in France, I have clients everywhere. Location never comes into it. Now, there are some considerations around time zones and it does take a lot of upfront planning and work and sometimes early Zoom calls but you balance that and you learn how to sustain yourself through that. So that international expansion is huge. And the big thing I see with a lot of companies is the access to talent that they might not have had if they were based on one office location. But this is not a normal remote working environment for you, for your team, for your clients, for any of us. We're dealing with so many different things. We're all dealing with the trauma of a global pandemic. We're all trying to manage home and life and work. Some might be managing children and partners. Some are helping family members. Some people are living on their own and they're lonely, which is uh, you know, what somebody said today. So what Marnie said today. Um, and our regular support systems have been taken away. And there's also you know, a lack of psychological safety. And that's present for us as entrepreneurs and for our teams. So, you know, whether we're an employer or an employee, there is that fear. Will we be OK? Have we got enough? Employees are asking themselves questions like, am I performing well enough? Am I doing well enough? Is my job there? Am I OK? So there is that fear that is present. So it's not a normal remote working situation. So, you know, I'm, I'm feel free to interact and post in the chat if there are any questions or if you agree with anything that's coming up. I can see it here. Um, on my screen, but some of the research behind remote working in 2020, seven out of 10 professionals working from home have experienced burnout this year. On average, and this is a report that is done by LinkedIn and the Mental Health Foundation. On average, those of us working from home have clocked up an extra four days of working a month, which equates to about 28 hours. That survey was done back in May, I believe, so I'm sure that if they were to redo that, the numbers would even be higher. So there's a lot of burnout. I'm coming up against it every single day within the teams that I'm working with, within the new clients, within prospects. 
I'm coming up against it in different uh, places that I do talks, even my friends. So I see this everywhere. And for us to be aware of this is super important and to put sustainability for ourselves and for, for the people that we work with. But as we discussed earlier, we don't need an office in order to run a business. And this is providing us as entrepreneurs with a huge opportunity. So Anna, many doors are you open have opened. for a question. Shutna. I totally am. Yes, what, Ryan. Uh, what uh, What are the symptoms of burnout? How, how do you know if if you if you've got it? Yep, yeah, everyone's from the leaders I've worked with. Their symptoms can vary, but generally, being unable to focus, feeling exhausted, extremely fatigued, lack of energy, struggling to make a decision, maybe a lot of. Ed, duplication of efforts coming up or errors in work um, not being able to kind of think straight high, higher levels of emotion and um, the feeling not being able to switch off you know so that constant scrolling that constant checking emails they're all symptoms of workplace burnout but it, it varies for for everyone I think that the, the biggest thing that we can do is leverage self-awareness within ourselves because it fluctuates every day. You know, some days we feel on top of the world, some days we don't feel so good. So we need to get a daily pulse on that. It's not just a case of, am I burnt out this month? It's a case of, how am I feeling today? Thank you. Good question though. So let's talk about sustaining yourselves as a leader. So some of you love working from home and that's fantastic. And I would love you to share your experiences in the chat with everybody else, because that's, that's a huge win. But some of us do struggle with that and uh, do struggle you know, at times. So we struggle to switch off. We struggle to maybe switch on. We struggle to find that balance. We struggle to actually take breaks and eat lunch and be mindful about eating rather than trying to do a million emails while eating a sandwich. You know, we struggle maybe to get out of the house. We struggle to build meaningful relationships. So there are a lot of challenges within it and it can mess with our heads. So how do we show up effectively? One of the number one things, and I, I spoke to an entrepreneur last week and she said to me, you know what, Shauna, I am that person that is answering emails at 3 a.m. I have a child at home that requires a lot of my attention. I'm trying to manage my workloads. I'm trying to juggle everything. And I just, I can't switch off. I'm always on and I'm working at crazy hours. And she said, where do I start? This all is just too overwhelming. Where do I start? I've done this for so long. So, so many people are used to it. Their expectation is that I'm always going to be there. And my answer was simple. It was start with one non-negotiable, just one. So ask yourself, what is my non-negotiable for me on a personal level every week or every day? I'll give you some examples. A personal non-negotiable could be that I'm gonna go for a walk each day or that I'm gonna take an hour to myself in the morning and not look at my phone. Or if I'm gonna have breakfast without technology, or I'm gonna actually take 30 minutes for lunch, or I'm gonna switch off at 6 p.m. Just start with one non-negotiable each week. So ask yourself, I know we're Tuesday today, ask yourself tomorrow, from tomorrow starting, what could be that one non-negotiable? Something that can give you energy, something that fills your cup up, something that fills you up and that serves you well. So going back to basics from an energy level, from a time management perspective is really important. The biggest win that I see with my clients when I'm working one-to-one -one with them is looking at their calendar. So oftentimes we don't challenge what's in our calendar. We don't actually challenge the meetings that are there, whether it's a reoccurring meeting that's been going on for months or somebody that wants to have a call. We don't challenge what's the agenda? What are we supposed to get out of this? Do we need to have a meeting? Is that the best form of communication for us? Or could we collaborate on a Google Doc together? And I'll give you some more ideas around how to collaborate like that in a while. But look at your calendar and start getting curious. Is there anything that you can delegate maybe to somebody else on your team or maybe a contractor that you work with? 
do you really need to show up for that meeting? Is it important or do you need to, you know, lower the cadency of that meeting? Asking yourself these questions and not just accepting what's in your calendar, meeting after meeting after meeting is really important and you have the right to do that. Another area is upfront planning. So something that works really well for my clients have been able to sustain themselves is to plan up ahead. So however you like to plan, whether it's putting pen to paper, whether it's planning on a Friday evening for Monday so you can relax and wind down at the weekend. Recently, one of my clients set up what she called a parking lot. And that was a to-do list that sat on her desk. And what she would do is any time that she would think about work in the evenings when she was switched off from work, instead of having the idea to open her laptop and just do it or write it down or send that email, she would put it on her parking lot, which was a piece of paper. So that gave her the flexibility to actually get things out of her mind and onto paper and held her accountable to not opening back up the laptop after work. So small habits can really start to pay off for us around our boundaries. And finally, it's looking at those healthy boundaries that we need to set. If anybody has watched The Social Dy Dilemma on Netflix, you would have seen and, and you know maybe heard a lot of information around how much we're using technology and social media and how distracting it is and how it was built to do that, to suck us back in. So instead of being reactive, how can you be proactive with your time when you're working remotely? So asking yourself, what are my daily and weekly priorities, both in life and in work right now? Are you clear on those priorities? And based on those priorities, how do I need to restructure my schedule on a daily or weekly basis? And am I being realistic with myself? That realistic aspect is so important. We need to show up with more compassion for ourselves more than ever. And what I often find is we set these huge goals and these huge expectations that sound wonderful, but they aren't realistic. So that's what I say, start small with just one boundary, with just one non-negotiable. What could that be for you? And asking yourself, when I look back over the times in the last couple of months where I've really enjoyed my work, where I really felt productive, where I really felt creative, where was I? What was I doing? Who were the people that I was around? What was I listening to? What was I eating? What were the time management practices I had? Can you do more of that? Can you replicate that in some way? And what's worked well for you over recent weeks in terms of time management? And what actually needs to be addressed? This is a question that I myself ask myself every single week. What worked well this week? What didn't work well? What do I need to change? Because we are changing, we are adapting all of the time. So asking, being able to coach ourselves around these questions are super important. Let's look at communication strategies. As I said, there's two types of communication in remote teams. So there's synchronous communication, which is what we are doing now. So it's having meetings in real time. It's having meetings, having webinars, having discussions, having phone calls, video conferences, it's going for a coffee, uh, if you're having a coffee with somebody in your bubble, it's communicating in real time. And this communication was built around and primarily for an office-based environment. It was based on the considerations that two or more people are in the same place at the same time in person together. But this has led us, and only following asynchronous communication has led us as now a remote workforce to be Zoomed fatigued. How many of you have heard people feeling fatigued by Zoom calls? And that is because we are leaning too heavily into synchronous communication. What we don't know about is one of the biggest benefits around remote working, which is asynchronous communication. So that is communicating in delayed time. You do not need two parties to communicate together at the same time or in the same time zone. It is, for example, when I send an email, when Roger sends this video on YouTube, when we send a message using the likes of Slack or Google Chat or WhatsApp. That is in delayed time. 
So for us as business owners, how can we leverage this with either our clients, with our team, or with anyone we interact with to save ourselves time and to save ourselves from that meeting after meeting after meeting? And really it takes effort. And the first thing is what can we automate? So if you have a team, this will be incredibly helpful for you to understand, which is using the likes of Slack or any of those messaging tools, you can automate a lot of the work. So if you're working with contractors, for example, and every week you have a weekly standup where you talk about what they have worked on, what they plan to do for the next week and what their blockers are. There are ways that you can automate these conversations so it's written and it doesn't have to actually take up everybody's time. Another great example, which we can all do, is improve our written communication. So here is an example of under communication and an example of over communication. And I know which one I prefer to receive as a question. Because in the under communication, we have somebody that's very direct, but doesn't give enough information. This actually leaves us with more questions than answers. So it's not specific, it's not detailed, there's no time in it, and it will require a chain of back and forth messaging. Whereas when we over communicate, we are specific, we're detailed, we have a timestamp on it, we have an example, we give all of the information up front. So we leave the receiver with, with little to no questions at all. So they can come straight back to us. So not only are we gonna save our own time by asking better questions, but we're going to respect everybody else's time. And the final thing, and this technology is called Loom. I'll post it in the chat window if anybody wants to look into it. It's a free tool that I use, that a lot of the teams I work with use, and it's a really effective way of communicating asynchronously. So what it is, it's an extension that you can download on your browser, and you can share your screen and you can talk into your microphone. So you can talk through whether it's a proposal for a sales prospect or whether it's an update for one of your team members. You can talk through, you can send that link and they can watch it at a stage that suits them. And you will also get a notification when anybody actually watches that video. So if it's for a sales prospect, it's quite a good tool to use, but it is a form of asynchronous communication. It's saving time, it's giving updates, it's communicating more effectively, and it's definitely more engaging. So Donna, are, around... you're, you're, you're at a little uh, break now, a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, over communication sounds to me negative. And yet the way you've described it, it sounds like perfect. Please clarify. Right. Yes. So there is a difference between what I should add into that is over communication that's calm. Which is, which is the screen that I have up now. So there's a difference between over communication that's calm and that comes from a place of respecting everybody's time and over communication that is distracting and bombarding. So there, there is a difference there. I think when it comes to, um, when we come from a place of how can I save everybody's time and how can I respect everybody's time, we communicate in a calm way and we give as much detail as possible up front. When we communicate with no consideration around respecting people's time, then we send too many of those under communication messages and we keep chasing and we keep following up and we keep bombarding people. And that's when it gets noisy and that's when it gets distracting, especially on teams when we're overstimulated with too much communication, we can't actually focus on our work or be creative. There's no time to think. Great, uh, a question from Ashok. What mode of communication according to you is most effective? Text message or Zoom call or phone call? Yeah, I would love to know, is that in relation to clients or to your team? We're gonna go through some research behind effective communication and, and where that needs to show up actually in a minute. Um, but maybe Ashok, you could clarify exactly what the audience is that you're speaking to remotely. And I can delve into that in the next slide. Clients. 
clients. Okay. Um, so in terms of, of clients, I think that, you know, one thing that you should do upfront is understand those communication preferences. So that's something that I do on the first session with my client is ask them what their preferences are. If they're a very busy entrepreneur or they have a large team, they don't want another email. Instead, they might want a Loom video that goes through um, the updates from our sessions, right? So I would always start asking that person what that preference is. In relation to sales, I believe that, and, and there's research behind it, which we actually look at here, is that body language is so important. So when we're building those interpersonal relationships, either with prospects that we're working with or new clients, it's very important that we have the opportunity to see them. So we communicate out of 100%, we communicate 55% through our body language. So ask yourself the question, where is it most important for me to see my clients? Where is it most important for them to understand my tone of voice? and hear my tone of voice? Where does that make a difference in my communication? While text messaging or WhatsApp messaging can be really effective and that text communication, you have to ask yourself, where might you be missing the other elements of the multi-dimensional ways we communicate? So starting there is a good place to start. But I worked with a leader recently who had, he was a, an operations director in a multinational company. And when he worked with me, he was really concerned that he had lost three of his employees. And he approached me because he didn't know why. He said, Sean, I don't know why I've, I've lost these employees. I've had phone calls with them every week. They were, you know, super engaged, I thought. They were doing their work and everything seemed fine. And then they handed in their notice and I've lost three of the best team members I've ever had. And when we dived into it, we explored that again, he was having phone calls as opposed to video calls. And when we, when we discussed that and when that came to light, he really had an epiphany moment. And he thought, if only I had seen them, if only I could actually see them on the screen, I would have known that their words weren't matching their body language. So how we express ourselves, it does come through our body language, whether we try to or not. And as leaders and as individuals who want to be more than just good at working from home, if we want to be effective at working from home, we have to listen on a deeper level, not just to the words, not just to what's being said, but sometimes with what's not being said. So the next time you're on a Zoom call or the next time you're on an important call, whether with an employee or a sales prospect, tune into the body language. Look at the eye contact, look at the shoulders, look at where the hands are, look at the facial expressions and tap into that. What does that tell you? What information can you gather from that? It's very powerful and it's a skill that we can develop. So finally, when you're looking at team meetings or any meetings that you have, what are you doing to make sure that they are as effective as they can be? Because if you're having meetings, you need to make sure they're effective. So making sure that there's an agenda up front. If there's any meetings in your calendar that does not have an agenda, ask for one or create one. And make sure that it's very clear what action points need to be taken for each agenda item. And then finally, look at who's going to be accountable for each of the action points. That might be something that needs to be discussed or you know, uh, discovered on the call, and that's okay, but to make sure that that is done as well. And finally, one of the most important things that I have used or my clients have used is what's called that parking lot. So to make sure that you're staying on track, create a virtual parking lot, whether that's a Google document or you write it down on a notepad. If something comes up that's taking you down a rabbit hole or something that's come up that is not on the agenda point, ask to put it in the parking lot and decide how to deal with it later. And creating those one-to-one -one meetings, again, how do we make sure that they're more meaningful? So whether that's with a team, with a client, the value, we have to see value in being able to have one-to-one -one meetings. 
And there is a ton of value. There's so much value in that interpersonal uh, relationships of remote working. So from a team level, as a leader, making sure that you're consistent with those one-to-ones and making sure that there is an agenda up front again so that people can discuss what's going on and the things that cannot be addressed on a daily basis. So when we look at interpersonal relationships, you know, they're really key. They're, they're key when we, uh, they're key as entrepreneurs, right? In everything that we do, relationships are so important, whether it's with our clients, our vendors, our partners, our team, and how do we do that remotely? The first thing that I ask leaders to think about is how approachable are you making yourself in a virtual environment? So when we're in the office, we can leave the door open and people can come and they can they can come in and have a chat whenever we want, right? We, we're, it's physically noticed that we are open to have a conversation, but when we're remote, we switch ourselves off. Uh, we don't have that visibility. So how can you create, uh, you know, that virtual open door policy? So have you lost sight of how your behavior can actually close your door? So for example, even when we're showing up on calls, are we actively checking our phone? Are we actively looking at emails on the other screen? Are we not making eye contact? People are aware of how we are expressing ourselves. So are we losing interest or losing interest in people that want to actually have conversations with us because we aren't expressing ourselves as approachable remotely? So something that an entrepreneur that I've worked with recently has done is created uh, a coffee and connect calendar uh, link. So on a certain days for 15 minutes, he's left himself open for coffee and chats. And this actually might be a great one for you as well, Marnie, that people can book time with you to have a, to have a coffee, to have a chat online. And it's based on a time that, that suits you. And it is that open door pro approach um, to interpersonal relationships. And finally, you know, when we're, when we're looking at building those relationships online, I think what really matters in 2020 is that we recognize each other. So, you know, that we, that we show up and recognize the efforts that we're all putting in, whether on a team level, even recognizing our clients, even recognizing the efforts that Roger puts into VBN events every week. It's saying, you know what, good job, good effort, right? So that, and it's coming from a genuine place and recognizing ourselves, you know, that's equally as important as entrepreneurs, you're all here today, whether some of us are going through a more tough time than others, we are all here, we are all standing and we're all continuing to, to move forward and progress through this. So it's recognizing ourselves and recognizing each other. And when I work with teams and they create a culture of recognition, it truly transforms their organization completely. They're looking for ways to celebrate each other and they're more eager to develop their efforts for one another. But when we are working remotely, our team really need a rallying point. They need a compass, they need a North Star, just like you do, entrepreneur. So we, we need a common goal, we need a purpose. And if we have a team without a purpose that's remotely, you will have a team that is not really motivated and engaged. So as a leader, how are you creating that North Star remotely? How are you showing up and putting that at the forefront of everything that you do? How are you doing that for yourself? On days that haven't been so easy this year, how does your purpose continue to inspire you and keep you going? Shona, can so you something... give us some examples of what a North Star might look like for a solopreneur? A North Star, for sure. I can give you my North Star, which might be a good example. My North Star is to help leaders truly enjoy their companies and their jobs more by having effective remote teams. And my North <clears throat> Stars, I actually write down in the back of my work diary. And I write down all the little wins that the entrepreneurs that I've worked with have had. So on the not so great days, I can go back and say, you know what, I have, I have had these little impacts 
on people's lives, on people's businesses. And that is my North Star. That is what I go back to, you know? So, so it's, how are you serving? How are you serving others? And, and how are you communicating that to yourself? How are you putting that at the forefront of what you do? And how are you living into that? And then how are you communicating that to your team? Whatever that be. Thank you. So something I, I, I wanna chat about is, is team engagement and how do we build that engagement? And it, you know what, it, these engagement activities don't, when I think about engagement, it's not a case of, of just running another meeting. We don't need another meeting. We can do different activities with our team, even with our clients that really just, you know, exceed their expectations. So one, one thing that can be really useful is, is icebreakers, just like we do in, in VBN, but having those icebreakers at the start of a meeting to get everybody onto the same page, to get everybody on a social level to connect. So rather than just going straight into agenda points, so those icebreakers, whether it's share two words on how you're doing, any two words in the chat window, whether it's share a picture that would describe how you're doing today, we start to get a pulse on how people are feeling and how they're actually doing. Something that's really effective around team building or client building, or even if it's a project retrospective, is the idea of activities on calls. So, so one activity I love to do is a stop, start, continue. So what should we start doing in relation to X? What should we stop doing in relation to X? And what should we continue to do? Again, maybe it's a project retrospective. You can look at what did we like? What did we learn? What was lacked and what did we long for? Or sometimes it's in the middle of a project where you're stuck on something and you can do an activity around what's working, what's stuck and what are some ideas around ways forward. So these are all ways that you can generate ideas and start collaborating and innovating online. Any questions on that before we move on to the last piece? Doesn't appear to be any questions in the chat. Okay. Anna. Oh, Great. yeah, Fumi has one. Oh. Okay, sure. Fumi, so shall I read, shall it, I read out? it out? Whatever, still, yeah, read it out. Still quiet. Still quite many clients, oh, uh, still many clients apparently think only remote communication is remote, is rude, especially some older people. People insist on asking you to meet in person every time to show your commitment, even if the meeting totally could be done online. Do you have to accept it or is there any way to stick to the online communication? Mm -hmm. Good question. And for me, I'd wonder, you know, is now not the best time to have a, a valid reason to to not accept a meeting, right? And, and right. Shona, you should know that Fumi is uh, from Japan and perhaps their culture is a little different. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So for you, Fumi, I think it's a case of asking yourself, what are my boundaries and how what does meeting somebody in person um look like for me what what is enough so is it a case that i have one meeting a week in person two meetings a week in person i think starting there is really important and then it's a case of, of clarifying those expectations i know it might be different from a cultural perspective and i'm not familiar with your culture and how business is done there so bear that in mind when, I, when I'm speaking. Um, but what I find with my clients is sometimes we have a fear of setting those expectations so much. So whether it's a case that we have a fear of setting the expectation with the client that we're not gonna be available all day, every day, or uh, you know whether we're, we're not gonna be able to meet in person every time that they ask, that fear usually comes from us. And um, we, we build that up in our head to uh, to be something bigger than often it's not. So, you know, I would even go down that path and say, what's the worst that could happen? If it's a case that it's prospects and sales and it's very important to your business, okay, then you could be flexible with your expectation. 
but um you know i think it's 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 having those conversations and getting clear on what you will do around uh, online communication and again it depends i mean you know i am quite extroverted i like meeting people in person uh, however from working remotely i tend to to not really do that um because there isn't a need so saying something to my clients like you know well actually i've never met these clients in person before and these is these are the results that i've generated so there isn't actually a need for that gives them the confidence um in my expectation so how can you give them the confidence i think is important and, and show them the new way um sometimes especially older people they don't want to hear about the new way and that's okay too but oftentimes it's because they're afraid hope that Thank makes you. sense i appreciate it <laughs> yeah yeah i hope <laughs> it I hope it makes sense for me, uh, in in Japan, are older people revered? Um, yeah, it, it must be quite hard for them to adjust to this digital uh, technology world. And uh, this case is not specifically only in Japan because I'm facing something like similar situation even in New Zealand and United States as well. So. Uh, yes, definitely there would be a cultural difference uh, on basis, but I think this is a applicable question for in many different countries as well. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, and, and you know, maybe it's a case that you have to spend additional time up front educating your clients um, around the best practices. So maybe you create your own guide for clients to make them feel as comfortable as possible. Um, but how can you ease them into that in a way that's balanced? And maybe it's a case you start off in person and gradually, you know, uh, scale that to, to be more remote or more, more focused online when you go through those phases. The final point I want to talk about is for leaders of remote teams, how can we be more effective? And so oftentimes I speak with leaders and entrepreneurs that have a team that work remotely and they say, you know, I, I just, we're not communicating well. I don't really trust them. How do I know their work is, is being done? And it's not a great mindset to be in. And it's, it's not going to be effective when we're building teams. So we need to change that. And we need to understand that we are responsible for how we communicate. And it's our responsibility to improve that. We need to make it as easy as possible for the people on our team to do their very best work. And we need to empower them to be resourceful. So oftentimes I see leaders when we're managing teams, we're trying to fix the problems of everyone, trying to fix the problems of all our team. But really we need to empower them to be resourceful on their own. And that's where coaching comes in. So if you've ever had, if you've ever wanted results like this, whether it's alignment, engagement, ownership, accountability, commitment, then here's the habit that you need to that you need to uh, introduce into your communication. So if you want alignment, like Fumi said, around his clients and, and alignment around the communication preferences, what you need to do is explain expectations. If you want accountability, what you need to do is measure the results. And again, if you want commitment, what we need to do is appreciate people and recognize people. But when we start coaching individuals, what we really start doing is unlocking people's potential to maximize their performance. So oftentimes when I work with leaders, they are constantly given solutions to everything. But when they start coaching, they flip the question around. What do you think the solution is to this problem? And it changes the mindset of how things are done on a team because people are thinking for themselves in a new way that they haven't had to before. So when we think about coaching, it's about building awareness and responsibilities and it's really important in remote environments because we're all having to deal with personal issues as well as professional issues and time management. So when we actually start coaching our teams, we get them to generate that activation of natural learning for themselves. Again, it prevents us as leaders from always having to solve problems gets people to think for themselves. It guides people to create their own unique solutions and it shows them that we believe in them and that we trust them. And it really will change the culture of your organization forever. So we need to believe in people's resourcefulness. We need to not only provide solutions and move into fixing mode, 
We need to be listening on all levels to the body language, the tone of voice, the facial expressions, and we need to be present and in the moment in order to coach our team and the people around us. So how do we coach our team? Start by clarifying exactly what they need to get out of the conversation. What is it that you would like to get out of today's conversation? How is it that I can support you today in this conversation? What would you like to walk away with at the end of this conversation? And then begin by asking open-ended questions that dig into the current reality of the situation. Okay, so this is what you'd like to get out of, this, of the conversation today. Where are you now in a point of time? If we wanna go here, where are we starting from? What's the starting point? Tell me more about the current situation. And then ask them to consider the solutions or way for, ways forward. So what are some ways that you have been thinking about solving this challenge for yourself? What are some considerations that you maybe haven't thought of? And let them think. Too often times we don't embrace the pause. We don't let people think for themselves. We interrupt their thought process, which is in coaching. So pause and let people think for themselves and explore their ideas by asking more questions. So that could be an interesting idea. That could be an interesting solution. How might that work? What would that look like? And paint a full picture of the solution. Ask any more questions to follow up and set some timelines. Okay, great. So we've discussed three solutions today. We've dived into what that might look like. And you've said that the third idea is gonna be the most effective and it's something you can do immediately. So based on that, what are the next steps? When do you think you can implement this? So coaching isn't just for teams. Coaching can be used for your clients as well. If you have a frustrated client, if you have a client you know, that, that's frustrated around communication remotely, starting these conversations and using these steps remotely is really effective. So using the open-ended questions, asking different ways, using different language to get more out of the conversation. And again, focusing on the detail. So begin broadly, focus on the detail and probe those questions. So I would like to stop talking now <laughs> for a while. Um, and I would love to know, do you have any next steps from today? Have you any non-negotiables? Have you any takeaways? and new approaches for your team that you're, that you're gonna implement remotely. Or do you have any questions? I, Simon and Chris have questions. They're I raising do. their hands. Are you sure now? Thank you. It was very, uh, was very well, uh, your presentation. I took a lot of uh, information and um, I like to pride myself that I was to coach my team because COVID was a brand new thing for me, right? So when I started mm -hmm. to coach my people five months ago, um, now I can see where, where I can implement a little bit more. And I really like the fact that you said, you know, a team leader is, is coaching. So that's very... Uh, that's a very uh, well said. So thank you for that. Where's it coming? Thank you. And thank you for, for sharing your experiences. And I'm glad that it's worked out so well for you. It does take more time up front to have longer conversations at the start rather than just giving an idea and fixing the solution. That's our tendency as, as an entrepreneur and as a business owner. But in the long term, it's going to pay off because people will be able to think more deeply for themselves right and especially in remote environments when you're not always accessible so it gives you back more time and, and one more thing too as well um i became somewhat successful in what i do i also live in Kitsano. a lot of my clients are very very wealthy right and a contractor is always seen as the guy who bring the bad news right when i started and i was working on the tools with my pouch on and the architect or the designer was coming once a week to do a, a walk tour and when there's a problem, and this is exactly what I tell to, to my people on site or in the office, if there's a problem, don't just bring me the problem, bring me a solution with it. 
or some options. So as a leader, I like someone who has always my, my head involved into a thousand things at the same time, I can focus on every single problem. So if you bring me a solution, then I can just select one of the, uh, uh, if you bring me a problem and solutions, I can select one solutions. And then it's a three minutes decision and then I can move on on the next, the next issue, so. Fantastic, love it, well done. How, Simon, how did they respond? Uh, to be very honest, this is how I built my business. I was a carpenter working on tools. And when I became a redeveloper, some of my very wealthy clients, they saw a lot of potential into me. And uh, it was a, a master plan. It took, uh, so when I became, you know, in Vancouver, there's a lot of uh, flipping, home flipping. Well, yeah. me and my home flips, they cost me about a million and a half just into the renovation. Uh, so I had some angels investor that really invest into me because they, they saw that I was doing something different. I was not the guy who complained all the time. I'm the guy who brings solution. There's a famous architect, Archer Rickson, told me about 10, 12 years ago. He said, if you want to be an architect, you have to learn to be a bitch. I was 24 years old when he told me that. I didn't get it. I see him six months later. I go to see him. I said, Mr. Rickson, what do you mean by that? He said, everyone's going to blame the architect. If the, the, the carpenters or the subtract is something is too hard to achieve, they will just go up and blame the person above their head. So as a team leader, you have to be able to take it. You have to have a wide back. But when he told me that, this is when from that day, I start to bring solution. And this is what made the difference between me and a guy who complain and a guy who doesn't want to figure it out. As the contractor, as business owner, as all of us, 90% of uh, our work is to oversee problems. I mean, it can be very small problem or big problem with, in the future with a client. So this is how I see it. Oversee the problem before it happened. Uh, problem management is probably most of what a contractor has to do. Uh, but to bring solution with the problem, it will bring you so far, so far for ahead. Mm. Thank you. Back to you, Shauna. Uh, countdown, we've got uh, three or four minutes left. Great. So just to let you know, I have an offer for everyone that is listening online today to the Vancouver Business Network. I have a CEO and founder peer group for remote teams. So if you are running a team of five to 25 people remotely, if you're ambitious, driven and motivated to grow yourself, and your team and your leadership capabilities. In this peer group, you'll collect, connect with like-minded CEOs who are looking for growth. So oftentimes as founders, we have the brilliant concept, we're fantastic at business, we're able to bring in the money and the revenues, but the managing the people and growing teams is the bit that kind of is a bit sticky for us. So that's why I created this group. It's a, a group of like-minded entrepreneurs that are gonna come together to uh, develop themselves as leaders of remote teams. So what that looks like is an hour and a half monthly peer group call, a dedicated board for you and your peers, and a quarterly one-to-one -one coaching session with me. Um, so for today, I want to give the Vancouver Business Network, everyone listening online, is a 5% uh, discount. And you can message me here, you can message me on LinkedIn, or you can send me an email at shauna at operateremote.com. And I will send you the application form to make sure that you're the best fit and you're gonna get the most value from this. Shauna, thank you so, so much for sharing your uh, wisdom-based, experience-based uh, knowledge with us. Uh, your topic is hot, hot, hot. Uh, and I'm quite sure you have shared with, you've opened the eyes for many of us as to some of the things we could be doing uh, and aren't doing. Uh, personally, I, I love the idea of asking uh, those stakeholders how, how they like to be communicated with. Uh, I, I've never done that, uh, but I think it would open a whole wealth of better communication strategies than what I've currently been employing. So on behalf of BBN, I thank you very, very, very much for sharing your time, your talent, your wisdom with us this evening. I'm going to uh, uh, turn off the recording now, but uh, live uh, VBN members and guests, don't go away. <laughs>